So you're good to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you everybody who's here for attending. Um, we've called this to mark Black History Month. Um, as a union, race equality is obviously crucial to everything we do is, is all equality. Um, and um, we've organized it quite late. Um, we should have organized it far earlier, but there was a lot of things going on. Um, and I was also traveling in the middle of the month abroad. Um, and um, we wanted to do something to mark um, Black History Month. Just a bit about the history of um, Black History Month. Um, it's been around in the USA much longer than it has in the UK. It was originally um, in, the U in the USA, it's celebrated in February and not in October. Um, and when it was established in the UK, the idea of it was that October would kickstart um, a whole year of a program of events that people could put on or organizations that could put on. Um, so not to just sort of do Black History in, in October, forget about it the rest of the year. Um, uh, sometimes people ask questions about why do we have a Black History Month? Why do we mark Black History Month? Well, the answer to that is simple. And that is because our history and the history of African people has been, um, and I'm talking about the wider African diaspora, um, has been erased from history books, from the curriculum, and not told in a truthful way. And so Black History Month gives us an opportunity to um, mark our histories, to celebrate our histories, to educate and share knowledge and information, and just take stock of what we have achieved, but also to look at the continuing barriers that we um, still face today. Um, we have some um, fantastic speakers with us this evening. So how we thought we would run this meeting. I didn't even say who I was, did I? That's so rude, isn't it? So my name is Zita Holborn, and I'm the Joint National Chair of Artist Union England. I'm a, a lifelong trade unionist. So I'm also very much involved in another union, the PCS union, where I was until um, a few months ago, the national vice president. Um, and I'm involved in European and international level with the trade union movement and various committees. I'm elected to the Trade Union Congress Race Relations Committee and also to the TUC Women's Committee. And I'm elected to the General Federation of Trade Unions National Executive. I'm also a community activist and human rights campaigner, and I'm the joint national chair, uh, not the joint national chair, that's of Artist Union England, I am the national chair of Barrack UK, which is a campaigning organisation against racism and injustice faced by um, uh, racialised people both in the UK and globally. Um, and um, I'm a visual artist, as I would have to be to be involved in Artists Union England, but I'm also a multidisciplinary artist. So I'm a poet, um, an author, a vocalist, and a curator as well. So yeah, sorry about that. Should have introduced myself at the start. So um, we have two fantastic um, speakers and we're gonna hear from our speakers. There'll be an opportunity to ask, um, uh, questions and um, then what we wanted to do with any time we've got left is just open it up for um, a discussion with people here. We want to build, we've been trying to build um, a black workers network and we use the black, the term black in our trade union movement in its broadest political sense to encompass people from African, Asia, Middle Eastern, um, heritage and backgrounds who identify with the term uh, black in its political sense. So some people may use the terminology black and minority ethnic, but we try and avoid using those types of terminology in our description. Um, so um, anything people want to discuss and people interested in getting involved in um, a network going forward, um, we would like to hear from people you know, what's happening in their area in terms of any race equality issues. We know that racism is rife in the arts and culture sector. And so there is um, a huge need for us to address that. And we're really keen to hear from people so that want to get more involved in, in AUE 
um, because we're a very small operation. We're totally um, organized by volunteers who run the union. We don't have paid, you know, a big paid team of staff or headquarters or anything like that, that some of the bigger, more established trade unions have. So our first speaker today is Wilf Sullivan. And Wilf is the um, race equality officer for the Trade Union Congress. He's a long-standing trade unionist. Um, Wilf has worked in local government um, with young people in the criminal justice system, um, was a principal personnel officer. He was a regional full-time off trade union officer with NALGO, which is now part of Unison, and was the union's and was Unison's national black members officer before moving to the TUC. Um, Wilf is very involved in race equality, both in the UK and um, globally, outside and inside the trade union movement, and is a member of the um, uh, government ethnic minority employment stakeholder group, vice chair of UK Race and Europe Network, and an executive board member of the European Network Against Racism, amongst many other um, roles and positions that Wilf holds. And Wilf is going to speak to us about the work of the um, TUC uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Lawrence, I was about to say, <laughs> saying that. There was a TUC Stephen Lawrence task force. I will mention that. TUC yeah. anti-racism um, task force and the work that we've been doing over the last two years and how we propose to take that work forward mm and um, you know, decisions and actions that have been agreed by the TUC and trade unions recently at our recent Congress. Over to you, Wilson, thanks very much for being here. Uh, thank, thanks, Eta. And um, I suppose the, the, uh, the Stephen Lawrence Task Force is a good place to, yeah. to, to start to put this in context, really, because following the, um, the uh, publication of the our report by Sir William McPherson on the death of Stephen Lawrence and 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 the acceptance. Well, I say acceptance, but um, the the fact that institutional racism was uh, accepted by many people to be something that needed to be dealt with. Um, the TUC set up its own Stephen Lawrence Task Force, um, which which ran for. Uh, for for two years and published its results in 2001. And uh, I think it's important to say that a significant outcome of the work was that the TUC changed its rules uh, requiring affiliates um, to commit to promoting equality for all and then limiting all forms of, of harassment, prejudice and unfair discrimination, both within its own structures and through its activities. And as part of uh, almost like policing that, they set up a, a TUC equality audit, um, which uh, happens every two years. Um, one year it does general, it's general audit about um, where people are in the trade union movement, what the trade union movement is, is doing in terms of offering its services and how that relates to equalities. And the, the, the middle audit is one around collective bargaining, looking at um, uh, what trade unions are doing around collective bargaining on equality. Alongside this, the, the, the TUC also uh, included a sort of model recommendation uh, that they were uh, promoting for their affiliates to take on board. Uh, and part of that was that they that affiliates should be promote, promote should to promote equality for all, including through collective bargaining, um, campaigning representation, union organisation and structures and education. And that the unions should also look at their own employment uh, practices. And I think it, it, it's fair to say that um, you know, many trade unions um, recognise that they had a problem with institutional racism and that there was a need to do uh, more around racism. But there was a bit of a problem in my view. Firstly, that unions uh, continue to view uh, the problem of racism as one that only affected black workers. And I think it, 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 it's 
it's important to say that because in some ways, uh, in doing that, it meant that the vast majority of union members who were black thought, well, actually that's, that's something for black workers to be doing. And obviously that's not a way that you're gonna make uh, transformational change within the movement. Secondly, uh, whilst the movement recognized institutional racism, much of their strategy for tackling racism in the workplace was reactive. So they only did things when people came to them with a problem and centered, centered on dealing with individual instances of racism. And of course, if you do that, you're not going to um, be able to deal with the institutional uh, nature of racism and the way that that's structured into workplaces. And thirdly, I think racism in the broader political context was seen as a problem relating to the activity of the far right. Um, and this meant that whilst there was a renewed focus on the need to tackle racism in the workplace and the movement, much of the um, activity resulted in, in, in the problems of racism being externalized, externalized either through sort of external anti-racism, uh, uh, fascism campaigning, or in relation to cases being just viewed as a legal problem. And so, Ex uh, externalized uh, to, to employment tribunals and lawyers. Um, and though, of course, all of that is important, what it doesn't do is fundamentally change what's happening in the workplace. Um, so, you know, efforts were being made, but I think a lot more needed to be done. And I think there was an acknowledgement that, people, that more needed to be done. But one of the problems of, obviously is that um, as with all uh, public policy issues, that external factors can often play a role. And certainly um, the, the, the London bombings and the war on terror uh, as, declared, as declared by, 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 um, by Bush, had a significant effect on discussions about racism in the workplace. I mean, suddenly um, it was, you know, uh, issues about racism ceased to be issues about racism and more about issues around um, radicalization and actually black communities were, were recast in many ways, almost like the enemy within. And so we had the prevent program and all kinds of, uh, 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 stuff around community cohesion um, and really it became very very difficult to raise issues about uh, about racism um, alongside that obviously you know in terms of uh, casting black communities as outsiders we had this the rise of the uh, really um, poisonous this, you know debates around migration and asylum um, uh, which, you know, I mean, we're all aware and haven't got any to better. In fact, they've got a lot worse. Uh, and you only have to witness that by the reaction of the of the right wing press to to the to the attack on the um, on the the the, the, the centre at Dover um, earlier today. Um, um, no condemnation. Just oh well, it's you know we've got problems with migration. Um, and so it took actually the murder, the brutal murder of George Floyd, actually to bring racism back onto the agenda. And it's so sad to reflect that actually, um, you know, people have to get murdered uh, before, uh, as a society, we'll talk about racism. And I think what, one of the things that that, that done and the, the, and the revitalization of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, made all kinds of organizations think about what it is they were doing or weren't doing around race equality and the uh, and, and the TUC was no exception to that. Um, and so um, in 2020 the, 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 the TUC set up uh, the, the current anti-racism task force which terms of reference were to to conduct a review on the progress of race equality across the trade union movement since, since the, the Stephen Lawrence task force, agree that unions need to take action 
to increase representation of black trade union members at all levels of trade union democratic structures. Um, to agree that unions of the TUC should take action to increase recruitment, retention, and progression of black staff uh, within the movement and address ethnicity pay gaps within their own organizations and agree uh, on actions to ensure unions organized, educated, and, uh, and trained to combat racism and deliver race equality sustainability. Uh, and the way that that, that uh, the task force was set up, um, which had senior members of, uh, of the, the General Council and General Council Task Force, uh, was to um, uh, organise the work around four work streams, which were suggested by, by the TUC's Race Relations Committee. These were on organising, collective bargaining, unions as employers and public policy. And I'll say a little bit about each one. Uh, um, no, I won't go in, into great detail. And many of the, most of the activities that were done by the work streams as a result of the work streams discussions are, are on the TUC website. And I'll, I'll put a link in the chat um, in, in a little bit. But around organizing, um, several things happening. One was, um, and, and let me say, one of the importance of, of, of having a work stream around organising was looking at how we can, as a trade union movement, involve more black uh, workers in the trade union, uh, get people to join and get people to actively participate in the movement. So uh, a number of things were done, and I won't go into everything, but I'll mention some of the things. One is we done, you know, several organising events. Uh, one including a, a sort of listening activity, so that uh, uh, we could uh, gauge people's experience of 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 what happened around organising and collective bargaining in the workplace. Uh, and we had a couple of case studies where people giving examples. Uh, one from Bexu and another from Unison about what they were actually doing. Uh, we also, because the TUC has a, a sort of regional uh, structure and has regional black members committees and in some places networks, we done a sort of survey of how they were working and also then brought together the regional secretaries and the chairs of those networks or, or um, uh, 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 committees together to talk about what the problems are, uh, what needed to be done to actually build those networks. Because I think it's really important to say that, um, you know, there's not enough of black activists to, for us all to be, you know, sitting in silos in trade unions. We need to be working across, across unions, both to support each other in terms of, you know, uh, increase, uh, driving what unions do around race equality, but also to be active you know, with 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 organisations in in the regions and in the co localities within within our um, communities, um, and this is an ongoing piece of work. And, uh, and the TUC has subsequently employed a worker uh, to look at how to help build those build those networks. We also, in terms of organising, um, started a, a pilot program, an activist. A program for for uh, for black activists, which were piloting in the southwest region, and part of the reason uh, for that pilot is, is not to be another training course, but as a way of bringing people together, uh, so they can identify things that they want to know, things that they can do together, and eventually we hope that that particular cohort will be, be, be form the basis of a new network in the region. Um, but we're not. Once the pilot is completed, what we're looking to do is run similar courses on an ongoing basis in all the other regions as well, as part of an, an organising drive to build a bigger and bigger networks uh, of, of, of black workers across each region. Um, also, as part of uh, that stream, there was a, a number of webinars that were organised one on black women workers which happened at the um uh, at the women's tuc's women's conference um another one on 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 organizing black workers which happened at the black workers conference and we also organized an international webinar looking at 
uh, what was happening in the fight against racism, you know, in different parts of the globe. Uh, because I think it's important that we recognise that, you know, that, that, that this is a global struggle. Um, on the collective bargaining uh, website, um, website, uh, work stream, um, uh, we, we engaged with trade unions looking at what they were doing around collective bargaining, but we also done two specific things. One was to bring together legal uh, officers from trade unions to look at what trade unions were doing around uh, strategic litigation or what they could be doing around strategic litigation. I mean, one of the things I mentioned before was that a lot of unions' responses have been around individual cases um, and in some ways just responding um, to the cases that come. And so one of the things that uh, we were keen to get unions to think about is analysing those cases uh, that they were taking, uh, looking at the uh, basis on which they took cases and actually identifying patterns which they could use to be more strategic about how they use the courts. Um, uh, because actually, um, yeah, we have seen in the past strategic litigation used to really push the, the, the law forward. And somehow, and this hasn't happened around race. Um, uh, and using indirect di discrimination um, uh, provisions to push the issue around pay, for example, is a good example of what unions could be doing. Um, we've also, we also set up a, a project um, around health and safety, and that was partly as a result of the task force, but partly as a result of the disproportion of deaths we saw um, during the pandemic. Uh, and I think one of the things that uh, the pandemic really brought home is how health and safety, you know, is an is a, is a issue of race. Um, the, the problems that black workers had getting uh, uh, PPE, being placed in the front line, um, while what was workers were in, and generally their health safety and welfare not being taken any uh, into consideration um, what, what was very public. Uh, but one of the things that we know is that in terms of health and safety, it's one of the areas where trade union health and safety reps have more power than other trade union reps really. And so part of this project is about actually getting people to um, understand that getting more black workers involved in, in, in health and safety and being health and safety reps. And the other part of the campaign that we will be doing is make is campaigning to um, get accidents. Um, you know, all workplaces have accident books, but that, that people's um, ethnic monitoring should be done of accidents. Because we know, um, um, sort of anecdotally that because black workers are working in often working in more dangerous frontline jobs that they're more more um subject to 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 accidents and even death at work uh, the the evidence is is just not there uh because it's not collected on the unions as employers um we've done a survey of uh, of um unions to see what they were doing around race equality um, in, in the, as employers. And off the back of that, uh, we formed a sort of HR network of union HR um, professionals to talk about what it is that they can be doing to improve uh, what they're doing um, in the unions in terms of increasing the employment of black workers and actually uh, dealing with problems of, of racism within unions that black workers experience. And alongside that, we also uh, done, 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 done a survey uh, and some focus groups uh, of black employees of trade unions, um, which um, ask them about their experiences of working for trade unions. Um, and that we will be publishing soon. I mean, I, it will come as no surprise to any of you really to know that, I mean, part of the results of that survey is that um, uh, black workers in trade unions ex experience the same kinds of problems as, uh, as is it, is it in terms of any workplace, in terms of problems about access to training, promotion, bullying, um, 
all, all of those all of those kinds of things and i think um uh one of for me one of the most important things about doing that piece of work is that it was the first time black workers in trade unions the work for trade unions had ever been asked about their experience at work um and needless to say it sort of um uh, uh, ruffled a few feathers it's been a bit of a debate about oh, uh, what's published and when it's published because obviously you know you always get this thing well do we really need to be washing our dirty linen in, in public but I just think it's really important that we acknowledge the problems if you're going to deal with the problem you have to acknowledge the problem that you got uh, if you don't uh, you're not and lastly um we we had a work stream around public policy and we organized a couple of uh, round tables with um with, with unions and and organizations that that we work with uh and were planning to set up a, a, an anti-racism network and i think for us the, the the thing about that is that lots of people are doing lots of campaigning around racism but um one of the problems, and certainly in the trade union movement, is it's just not joined up. And so it's not as effective as it could be. Um, so part of what we're trying to do is work out how we can be more effective in campaigning and campaigning jointly across the movement and with our partners in the community and with anti racism other anti-racism organisations um, to, 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 to maximise uh, what we're doing. Now, I won't tell you that much more. I'll just go on to uh, uh, what's going to happen now, because as a result of the work of the task force, um, the 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 uh, the task force came to an end at Congress, which happened a couple of weeks ago, uh, and there was a, a report along with an action plan uh, for unions and a manifesto, which um, uh, trade unions were were asked to sign up to. Um, but I think what, and I'll I'll put the link to all this stuff in the chat. But one of the thing I think the important lessons that we learned from the 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 um, Stephen Lawrence Task Force is that you can't just do do have a task force write a report and then do nothing else, because inevitably what happens, and we know it with lots of reports, is they end up gathering dust on a shelf. So one of the things that the race committee uh, recommended to the general council, the general council accepted, and it uh, and it's, was that that the TUC create an implementation and oversight committee, uh, which his role will be to reg report regularly to the general council and annually to Congress on the progress and outcomes of the uh, of the action plan and the manifesto. And really, their job is to you know, push unions to implement what's in the action plan and manifesto, and that that that's going to happen over a five-year period. Um, because I mean, I think there's a recognize, recognition that you know the TUC can write as many reports as it likes, but actually, if unions aren't going to implement the actions that um, are recommended uh, from the work that's been done, then nothing is going to be changing. So. The strategy of having an implementation and oversight committee really is one of saying, well, actually, we've had the task force, you know, we've got recommendations, we've got an action plan and a manifesto, but now the real work starts, the work begins now. Um, that, you know, the, the task force wasn't the work, it's the implementation of that that is really important. And I think, I mean, I think the final thing to say, I mean, and I say for me, that, 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 you know, what has got to be important about this is about trade unions understanding that that race, race equality as other areas of equality have got to be at the heart of what they do. Um, that actually the most vulnerable people who are black workers, women, disabled people um, are, are, are not a minority, actually a very large majority. And uh, um, actually, if unions are, don't make the issues that affect those workers to heart what they do uh, they're not going to grow they're not going to be reinvigorated and actually in terms of building power in the workplace they are the people that are more likely to take action than anybody else because actually they've got the least to lose and you can see that with you know many of the disputes that are happening now in terms of 
uh, of the railways, for instance, it's not the train drivers, it's the people, the platform staff and uh, and those ancillary grades that normally nobody talks about at the railways at the forefront of that. And most of those black are black workers, as in many of the other disputes that we see. Um, you know, if we were going back to the mid 70s, they would be described as black workers disputes. But, you know, luckily, uh, we, 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 we've gone beyond that because nowadays unions do back, uh, back the issues uh, that, that face black workers in the workplace when, when, when there's a need for, to, to, to take industrial action. But it's really important that I think from this, this work that the movement does transform itself to understand uh, that actually race equality has got to be one of the central things that they do. Um, not, not, not just for the sake of black workers, but the, for the sake of everybody. You know, if you, if you raise the floor significantly for those at the bottom, everybody benefits. So um, I'll just stop there. Thank you so much, um, Will, for that overview of the TUC anti-racism um, task force. I'd ask people if they can hold any questions they've got for now, um, because our next speaker is here, and then we'll take questions um, for both speakers um after and I'm really delighted to um welcome lady ashley shaw scott ajaye and i feel like your backdrop ashley much is matching with my accessories <laughs> it's like uh, <laughs> I, I should have put green paint green pieces of my art up behind me i feel like i need to talk with you <laughs> i love it um and um I'm really, really happy to have Ashley here. As you can see, we've got quite a small turnout. We feel like perhaps it wasn't the best idea to try and compete with Halloween. Um, but what we've, we've done is we're recording this session um, and so we'll be able to share it with our wider mem membership and communities um, after this event. So hopefully people will benefit from being able to um, watch the session back later. Um, Ashley is a Stanford graduate with a BA in philosophy and visual art, amongst many other qualifications. Um, Ashley is the global head of research at Ajaya Associates, an award-winning international architectural firm, and is the artistic director of the World Reimagined, a national public arts and education project, um, which Ashley will be speaking about, which I've had the honour of being one of the commissioned artists participating in, and is um, a, a trustee of Africa Futures Institute, um, sits on the Prince's Trust International Africa Board, and is a trustee of the Board of Imagination, amongst many other um, roles and accomplishments. Welcome, Ashley, and thank you very much for coming along, because I know you've got a busy schedule um this evening as well um to speak about the world we imagined to us to us thank you thank you so much zita for having me i'm thrilled to be in uh the company of your colleagues at the artist union england so um thank you wolf for um sharing your experiences and, and learnings over um your past work I am just very excited to be here. So um, I'll dive in and I think we'll have time for a few questions at the end. So thank you also Zita for that gorgeous introduction. <laughs> um, what brings me here today is the world we imagined and this project has been an extraordinary journey personally. For, um, for me, I, as Zita said, I'm American, but I am third generation American. My, on my mother's side, our family is from Barbados. And I lived in the UK for seven years and currently live in Ghana in Accra. And I feel, somehow my life has taken the root of the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans. And so when this project uh, was presented to me over three and a half years ago, 
it really resonated with me on a very personal level as I try to understand my own identity and history and had struggled with the history as it related to the UK in particular, of course, also America. Um, but having grown up in America, I was familiar with the history and that relationship to enslavement. What was surprising to me when I came to the UK was understanding that people weren't really taught about the transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans. It, there wasn't much of a public discourse about it. Um, and I will say America for all of its problems and all of its challenges, there is a discourse about this and there is a discussion and it's very hard to deny that uh, this history happened because you have around 40 million descendants of enslaved people walking around the country. So um, whereas the UK has a really different relationship to it because it was not a land where enslaved people um, came to. And uh, for the most part, of course, there, there are exceptions, but, but uh, plantations were not in the UK. So um, in the way that they were in uh, mass in the US. So I just offer that as how I came to this project. Um, the uh, co creators, Dennis Marcus and Michelle Gale, they founded this and they had a conversation one night and Michelle, who you may know of, is a actress and singer and uh, public figure and is Jamaican Black British and Dennis Marcus has many years in the field of humanitarian work and um, formerly was the executive director of the Robert F. Kennedy Foundation based in the UK. And he is South African German. And so they had very different upbringings, very different lives that they led, but they both were surprised by the lack of information around the transatlantic slave, uh, trade and enslaved Africans uh, as, as two people who were educated in the UK. So they said, what can we do about that? How can we make this more accessible to people so that they understand the impact of that history? And ultimately they landed on sculpture trails. And for any of you who are not familiar with sculpture trails, it's the same sculpture, the same form many, many times. And they are placed in public places throughout a city or a country. In our case, we have seven host cities and we have a total of 103 globes. As Zita mentioned, she was one of our wonderful commissioned artists. And what all of the artists engaged in was a, uh, a themed um, offering essentially, we, we created the, the journey of discovery, which is nine themes that takes you from pre-colonial, pre-slavery Africa, all the way to today. And um, I'll speak briefly about those themes. I'll show some slides. And what we wanted to do was create somewhat of a framework so that people were able to engage in the story, particularly those who had no background, no understanding of it. We needed a narrative structure to bring them in. And this is one that we use throughout the organization. The part that I am responsible for now is the art, uh, artistic division uh, as artistic director, but, and I'll speak more about the art today, naturally, as I'm speaking to the Artists Union England, but, we have three other parts of this charity. They are the learning division where we created a curriculum for primary and secondary school students. And uh, primary students, we focused on Africa. 
which is our first thing. Secondary students, we use the entire framework that we built about the journey of discovery. And um, then we also had two outputs for the students. One was for them to create, to paint their own globe. Uh, and those were much smaller than the public globes that Zita did, for example. But they were able to digest the information that they were learned and then have this creative expression of it. Additionally, we had a, a poetic output. So again, students could give their perception and understanding of this history that they've learned and how it relates to them. We have now created an anthology of some of the poems that were written by young people and as well as the commissioned poems that we did, we um, requested from well-known poets who are um, from all across the UK. And that's a publication that we now have on our website, which Zita has um, put in the chat. So the, the other two groups that we have within the organization are the community group, and that really works to create synergies and networks between racial justice organizations on the ground in the UK. And uh, we tried to use our platform to help them to further their message. And then lastly, we have the Heritage Collection, which is a group of images and text related to the image to really crystallize the learnings that you see in some of the globes um, and in some of the um, curriculum that we've created. So that would be, for example, a image of the Windrush boat that the Windrush generation came to the UK on, helping for people to understand that they're called that generation because of that name of the boat. So just really connecting the dots for people who may have bits and pieces of this history. So uh, what I'll do is I'll share my screen and walk you through some of the globes so you have visuals of them. As artistic director, I didn't want to give too much direction uh, because artists, as you know, are brilliant at finding their way and um, synthesizing information and creating beautiful outputs. But, but there were a few things that were critical to me. We created the framework to, to loosely help our audience. And then also it was really critical to me that artists were true to their voice, but also were able to respect the trauma involved in this story and in this history. I was very clear that I didn't want a young person, for example, who's on their way to school, who may feel deeply connected to this history to be traumatized as they see this globe and having to deal with that trauma. We're particularly um, concerned about black and brown youth and, and making sure that this didn't negatively impact them. So, we tried to give as much flexibility as possible within the creative um, license that we wanted the artist to feel, but, but there was a limit at that point. And so I kindly requested that, that there was no image of torture, no image of um, the, the inhumanity that we all know existed. I felt that that story had been told and that at this point it wasn't productive. But what could be productive is to explore the humanity of the people who were treated inhumanely. And so that's what we really, I, I really hoped that the artist would embrace that in the various uh, ways in their own methods and their own points of view. And ultimately, I'm hugely proud of how all of the artists came to the table, what they brought, the grace and rigor that they brought to this project. 
So I will share my screen. Hopefully this will work. See that. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's see how this goes. Share a screen here. Okay, can everybody see that? We can see something saying you started. Yes, it's all up there. Yep. It's all up there. It. Fantastic, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so this uh, opening slide is the picture of Yinka Shonobari's globe. Yinka is our founding artist. He is the first artist we went to. So when Dennis and Michelle came to me and asked me about my thoughts on how to create the form, particularly since the architecture firm that I worked for, which Zita mentioned, AJ Associates, we have worked so many times on monuments and memorials, um, the Cherry Gross Memorial, for example, and the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which the building in itself is a monument and a memorial to the history of African Americans. So we had quite a bit of experience in this space, but when Dennis and Michelle came to me, I said, really, this should be artist-led. And I think the artist who would be able to share so much of his own practice is Yinka Shonabari, given how he has analyzed and explored the relationship between West Africa and the UK. So this here is the very first globe and it is called the World Reimagined. And we fell in love with that name so much so, we named the entire project after it. So next, um, these slides that I'm going to take you through, just bring you through the journey of discovery framework. And so this is the first theme, which is Mother Africa, which we just wanted for people to understand that Africa, A, is a continent, not a country, and B, that there's this extraordinary richness to all of the African tribes and cultures and people who have lived on this continent for millennia. So um, we really wanted to, to start there because too often the, the story begins at colonization. Then we go on to the theme, uh, or this is another Mother Africa. This is actually one of our artists who is based in Jamaica. So Arts Council England funded us to bring five artists from the Caribbean to the UK to create globes. And that was really powerful for us as a team, um, bringing in a different perspective and one, again, where the history is so apparent. If you have ever been to any of the Caribbean islands and seen any of the plantations or have experience the legacy, uh, you would know that, that their perspective is really critical in how we understand this history. Here we have the theme, the reality of being enslaved. And this is just as it sounds, we wanted people to understand from capture to transport to life in a new environment, what that reality was. This is a particularly beautiful depiction by Glenn and Jane, and that is a ball of cotton. And so uh, cotton was, of course, one of the biggest cash crops during the transatlantic trade and enslaved Africans. This is another one about the reality of being enslaved, um, slightly um, more abstract and trying to grapple with the power of uh, the people who ultimately were able to advocate for their own um, freedom, but also you, as you see the bullets all over this, the, the amount of trauma and violence that ensued. Here we have, we go into stolen legacy, rebirth of a nation. And that is the, really looking at the, uh, commodification of human beings and how it created an incredible economic growth for England and Europe. 
And so this is a particularly interesting depiction of that. Um, Kajare, the artist, is, is really focused on decentralizing uh, the European story. And she does not relate to that as a given or as the status quo. And in that, she's looking at the globe upside down, so to speak, in the sense that, well, what is upside down and what is right side up? Depending on your positionality, this could be many different ways. Um, and so, so um, that's her Kajai. And then we have Allison here, which is a mosaic, which um, she actually, she spent 420 hours on this globe, <laughs> which is extraordinary, cutting very small pieces of tile. And hers really looks at the hands, the metaphorical hands that built the UK through the slave labor. Um, and here we have the theme of abolition and emancipation. Here we really wanted to dispel some of the perceptions of this. If, if there's anything that people know about, I would say it's William Wilberforce. And he was the great abolitionist who led much of the movement in the UK. But what we wanted to help people to understand is that yes, he was critical and yes, he obviously we're all grateful for the work he did, but he was one of many, 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 many abolitionists, including enslaved people who were advocating on their own behalf. And so we're trying to um, reposition the agency in the fight for freedom. Also emancipation, there's a sense that, okay, the law was signed into practice and now everybody's free and we move on. That is just an oversimplification of what really happened and how some enslaved people didn't find out until two years later that they were actually legally free because that information wasn't disseminated to them. So, so we really unpack some of the uh, uh, unknown facts. This is another globe related to that theme. Then we move into a complex triangle. This is where we look at the evolution of the relationship um, and the, the understanding that the um, after abolition, when you look at World War I or when you look at post-World War II, that, that these relationships from West Africa, Americas, the Caribbean, into Europe and the UK, that triangle was still in action. Um, there, there, we look at the um, soldiers of World War I who were West African, who were fighting in a war on behalf of the mother country, so to speak, and really the war had nothing to do with their daily lives. Or we look at the Windrush generation and how they were invited and then what that really meant in the end for them to, to come to the UK. This globe looks at a, a kind of a kaleidoscope, I would say, of aspects of that history. You can see a lion in there that's associated, uh, of course, with um, Jamaica and Rastafarian culture. You see Benin bronzes in there and other symbols of West Africa. Here you see a depiction of the Windrush generation coming into the UK. Then we have echoes in the present. This is an important theme because you sometimes, when you're telling the story and talking about the transatlantic trade and enslaved Africans, people say, well, why are you still talking about this? That was hundreds of years ago. It's over, let's move on. And what we want to help people to understand is that it's not over, that the legacy is incredibly strong and that anytime you actually study or do any assessment of the lives of black and brown people, you'll see that 
the impact is still there, whether it's health disparities or education or um, infrastructure or housing, that there are many ways in which this legacy endures. And in this globe, we look at the what Curtis Holder uh, calls the talk. And so that's the, the discussion between black males and older black male with a younger black male, preparing him for the world that he is about to come into, into that adulthood, the, um, the potential challenges that he may have, and that many black families and brown families have to protect their children by warning them of these challenges that might come. This is another one, Echoes in the Present. Then here we have Still We Rise, and that theme is where we move into the celebration and acknowledgement of people who come from this history and this trajectory and have succeeded and uh, against all odds have been able to shine in their various industries and fields. Um, and so this is a very interesting globe. This is from our most uh, experience, I would say, our, our, our artist with the, the longest practice, uh, Winston Branch, who is from St. Lucia and is in his uh, mid-70s. And he really looks at the freedom of expression that he felt uh, by being an artist, especially when that was not expected of him as a Black man. And so in this globe, you see a lot of movement and, um, and I think that the, the, the brightness, the, the, the color really reflects his, his interpretation of freedom. And then here we have another globe. This is a Sierra Leonean artist who is um, relating this history to Sierra Leone. There we go. Um, then we have Expanding Soul. This is a celebration of culture. And so this is where we acknowledge the African diaspora's culture, which is all over the world, whether it's music or art or food. We, we see the beauty and brilliance. This is, uh, again, the same. You can see depictions of various aspects of Black life, whether it's carnival or getting your hair braided or um, a kind of roadside uh, food seller. And you can see the little nod to Basquiat. So really looking at the diaspora. Then we go into our last theme, which is reimagine the future. And that is the theme that we really bring to close this out. So we've literally walked this journey together as this is a trail and you've gone from one globe to the next. So what now? How do we bring this story forward? And what is your role in that story? And this globe by Nicola Green is really highlighting the challenges she sees with the intersection between climate justice and racial justice. And in, uh, she's wrapped uh, around the Guyanese rainforest. And, um, and then also you can see some of the ships that acknowledge the enslavement of Africans. But then at the top, she really explores the idea of rewriting how we see beauty and innocence. So she questioned why there were no black and brown cherubs when you look at um, you know, paintings, particularly in churches or um, religious paintings, and this idea of whiteness equating to purity and to innocence, and what it means to not have that image of black and brown babies also being uh, equated to that. And then here's another one. This, this one's quite interesting. This is Julia Knox, who is um, interested in the idea that of water, or not the idea, but the, 
the concept maybe of water and how water played such an important role in this history and what would happen if we just take all of the water away and then suddenly we don't have that same separation potentially that we create now um, in the sense of the facts. Africa, that's Europe, that's America. What if we take the water away, then we just end up being one ball, one rock. And what does that mean for our humanity moving forward? So um, another, this is, these are uh, our community globes. And the community globes essentially have a community artist who works with um, people in, for example, here with Rosanna and Leeds, community leaders and members and teachers and students and really works to understand what is the relationship between this history and that space, that city, and really bringing it into place and context and exploring it from that point of view. And so we have this one in, in Lambeth and the other one in Leeds, and we had it in, in all seven of our cities. And just to close, here are some um, here are some images of the globes at our opening, essentially, which is where we uh, um, in the dean's yard behind Westminster Abbey, where we brought 43 of the globes together. Those are all of the globes that are based in London together in one space. And that was a really glorious moment for us because these globes have been worked on at different times and different places. We had two studios that we created in the UK, uh, sorry, in London, and then studios in other parts of the UK where we had host cities. So, some of these were made at different places at different times, and then to get them all together, they really just sang or as a chorus and played with each other in the themes that they were exploring and the imagery. Um, that's another angle, another photo. And you can see them a bit from a bird's eye view. And that's it. So, I will conclude there and uh, thank you for your attention. It's a lot to say, it's, it's a complex project, um, but uh, we hope that it's something that you will get a chance to see in, if you're based in London, all of the Globes this week, we're actually extending the run because it was supposed to end today but we've had a, a wonderful warm reception and we've extended the run to um, bring all of the globes again in London to uh, Olympia, Olymp excuse me, Olympic Park. And then we are bringing uh, multiple trails up to Leeds. So we'll have a Northern finale too. And, um, and then in Birmingham, we have um, brought all of the globes together where they were previously spread out. So please check out the website and you'll be able to see where the trails are. They're no longer trails now that they are all together, but you'll see where the installations are. And um, we'd, we'd love for you to take part. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Zita. Thank you so much, um, Ashley. And even though I've seen like um, so many of those globes, either in person or, you know, events and online, it was still like really wonderful and uplifting, like to see them again in the slide slideshow. I can never get bored of them, but I even spotted one that I thought, hang on a minute, I've never seen that one. How have I missed that one? Well, of course, it's, you know, with over a hundred, it's possible. To do that. So that's now got me intrigued. I need to go away and really look, look, look at that one in more detail. Have I missed that one? So I, you know, studied all of them um, really well. And it has just been an honor and a pleasure to be involved in this project and one of the, the artists involved, particularly because I'm an artist that's centered, my art practice is centered on equality, freedom, and justice, and race mm -hmm. equality in particular. 
So this is almost like a dream project for me, you know, a project that's focused on what I do every day, trying to fuse what I do as an activist with what I do um, as, a, as an artist. Um, and I think it's just such an incredible and really important example of how we can use our platforms as artists and art practices to promote race equality and address race discrimination and injustice. And as, as the project does, educate or re-educate people on what does it mean, um, you know, to live with the legacies of the enslavement of African people. And yeah. I thought it was, uh, uh, when, when you mentioned William Wilberforce, it reminded me that on the bicentenary of the um, act, being abolished, we had a big focus. Now, I sit on the TUC Race Relations Committee, which Wilf oversees in his role at the TUC. Um, and we had a big project of work in that year. Um, and then we had a motion that went to our TUC Congress on this. And I spoke on that motion. I think I seconded it, if I remember correctly. And I talked about African Black abolitionists who had fought tooth and nail, fought on the ground and risked their lives and lost their lives to bring about abolition and yeah. reference William Wilberforce in the fact that he was being revered all through this year and celebrated in a way he shouldn't be in the context of what other people would live for. And I faced online abuse after that. Mm. Yeah. And some of that would have had to have come from our movement, which is why we had to get our own house in order and why, you know, the project that we've been doing, the anti-racism task force is really important and crucial that it has that focus, not just on um, organising and bargaining and what we do with employers and the labour market, but getting our own house in order and what unions do as employers as well. Mm -hmm. um, so really, really pleased to have both of you here and really appreciate that you've um, taken the time out from busy schedules and that we're ending Black History Month with, with this. I think that's, that's really great. Ashley, I'm aware that your schedule is busy and I wanted to check with you. Um, yeah. Have you got time for Q&A? And would you like me to take Q&A just for you alone or do you have the time for me to open it up for Q&A for both of you at this stage? Absolutely. I'm, I'm very happy to open it up. I, I can stay until 8 p.m. So I'd, I'd love okay. to hear your responses. Okay. All right. Thank, thank, thank you. Fantastic. So I saw one in the chat, but if anybody's got any questions they want to ask in person, do raise your hand. Either, um, you know, put your camera on and wave at me or hold up your virtual hand. And I did see one in the chat as well. Which I need to go back and find. Um, so the one in the chat is when unions fail to address issues, is the TUC a shoulder to turn to? Interesting question. But before um, you answer that, just want to check, has anybody else got any questions? Please indicate if you do, and I'll take about three together. I see W Monroe, maybe? And Will. That one is from W Monroe, yeah. That one's from W Monroe in the chat. We must have, you must have stunned everybody into silence. It looks like. <laughs> um, Will, I'll, I'll put that one to you. All right, no, because I had a question as well about what's next for the project. Okay, <laughs> so you can ask your question and answer that one all at once, yes. Um, no, a, a quick answer to, uh, to to the question when you need to fail to address issues is the TUC a shoulder to turn to. Um, the answer to that would be, Frank, no. Um, I mean, the problem is, is the TUC is a, in charge of the unions. The TUC is a trade union centre, so, you know, um, um, the unions fund it. And as with all relationships of money and power, <laughs> um, you know, um, those that pay, uh, pay the piper call the tune. So it's a, a difficult relationship. But what I will say, and it's one of the things that I, well, I talked about, um, networking. Is there's many black activists around the, the trade union movement that are experienced and that can help people, um, which is why we need to network. Um, um, because actually it's only through networking and working together can we tackle some of the, the very thorny issues 
that uh, that we face in the trade union movement. And you know, the trade union movement isn't any different from any other uh, institution in that respect. That we, you know, we face problems of racism, um, you know, and problems of power within the movement. But as I always say, that ultimately. Uh, the one one of the things about unions is they're a space where we can organise, but actually it's only if we're well organised that we can make our voice heard and and exercise some power and control over what happens in the movement. Hi. Oh, Apologies, yeah, I'm on mute. Um, do you want to ask your question for <laughs> Ashley, and then I'll take Sarah and then turn to Ashley. Well, yeah, I mean, my my question for Ashley was what's next to the... Pro I mean, it, well, I looked at uh, those games and I was looking at some stuff on the website where you're speaking. It's absolutely fantastic, you know? And I just wondered what was, it, what, what was next for the project because, I mean, I think one of, one of the things that um, I'm really aware of and and and, and you, you alluded to it when you were talking about... Um, the lack of narrative around the, the, the slave trade and colonial pro process in, in, in the UK. Uh, and it, it makes me think of an article I wrote a while ago for a trade union magazine about how actually the British are very, very good at whitewashing history. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it in, in every sense. So mm -hmm. one of the things that, you know, very good at whitewashing out is is uh, the contribution of black people in this country to the arts, you know, um, you know, um, you know, which, you know, because I'm quite interested in history, you know, when I found out, for example, the amount of uh, black and Asian people working in cinematography in the 1930s, such that they were forming their own unions. Wow. You know, you think, well, actually, what's happened to all those people and the other artists that were there and their evidence of their work, and you know, uh, as as some of the stuff that I was aware of in photography through the seventies and eighties. So I'm I'm particularly uh, keen to to know how you're going to try and cement yeah. <laughs> the legacy of the work in the sort yeah. of consciousness of our communities and more widely, really. So uh, we're trying to to spread our impact across uh, the society. Certainly, we believe that young people are a critical piece of that, which is why the curriculum is so important. Um, it, it means that they pick up the baton and that we're passing to them. We, we haven't built the organization to be a forever organization. Mm -hmm. Really, an idea that became a project that became a full-blown charity. Um, but we're, we're actually at the moment where we're trying to figure out exactly what our legacy is because the response has been positive. And we have built these incredible assets really from the, the curriculum to the globes to the bonds between some of the organizations on the ground to our online database. So we don't want to just let that drop. Um, and so what we, oh yes, thank you for that, Esther. Um, this is the the Esther who's on the call is um, is leading in the, the heritage collection that really offers those images um, for people to, to learn from. So the globes themselves, we are auctioning off and we are encouraging people to have them in, in public spaces. Some of our sponsors will be, will be buying them um, as well as our philanthropists who will buy them on behalf of an organization so that they can remain in the public. Um, we also, I would say, our legacy is in the artists. Um, I think a lot of, for a lot of the artists, like Zita was saying, it was a really impactful project where things that for her, for Zita, of course, this was quite central to her practice. There are quite a few artists for whom this was a new topic, even if 
their history was somehow related, it, it was not in their practice in a very direct way. And so I think the time that they spent researching and ruminating and really understanding this history will be part of the impact. And, and I'm very curious over the next few years to see how it manifests itself in artist practice. And then maybe, we'll see, um, maybe if we extend the program, it will go into other places. So we could potentially do it in the US, the Caribbean, West Africa, and other parts of the world. Thank you. And Will, you might mm -hmm. want to put the word out to trade unions. They may wish to buy a globe and put it in their headquarters or in the grounds of their headquarters, because you know lots of trade unions have got space and buildings and it would be fantastic for them to have some public art. And I know lots of unions have purchased art or taken art on loan, you know, to and sculptures and things to put in. So um, you know, that is a, a an option there. Um Sarah had her hand up patiently waiting. Hello. Ashley, I wanted to say thank you very much. That was really informative. And it was a real pleasure to listen to you and look at the artwork behind you. Thank you so much. Um, my question's already been answered about what you intend to do with the globes. I was particularly interested, just from a personal point of view, about the globe of Guyana, because my father's a Guyanese. And um, so I was really interested to see that. Thank you so much, because Guyana often gets left out of the West Indies for whatever yeah. reason it, it really does doesn't it yeah. it's not an island. it often gets left out and so it's a shame my father couldn't see this but he would be delighted to have seen this because he knows all about my dad and uh, i just actually i just wanted to thank you the artwork is superb and everything you've done you know the 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 concept of africa was just just mind-blowing and the fact that people don't know that Africa is a continent and a country and not a country still baffles me in the 21st century what are children being taught in school what exactly are they being taught not a lot in the UK that's for sure <laughs> you know when I was growing up when listen when I was growing up here all black people came from Jamaica all Asian people came from Pakistan all Eastern Asian people came from China, mm -hmm. and um, that was it, really. Yeah. And if you fit that category, well, then they slot you in one conveniently. Mm -hmm. And then they use nasty words to, to, to describe a mixture of those races. But you know what? We'd like to think things are moving on, but to think that, that Africa is a country and not a continent, well, it beggars belief. You know what? I don't know what kids are being taught, but... I don't know if it's the teachers or the children just not paying attention. I think it's maybe a bit of a both, but I'm not making excuses for the teachers. But when you think of the diversity of teachers now, yeah. one, would hope, one would really hope that they would have knocked that on the head a long time ago. You know, it's really interesting what you're saying, Sarah, because what, um, and similar to what you were saying, Will, the, that there is a willful um, obs obscuring of information. So even if it's not misinformation, it's information that's hard to get or information that's not entirely untrue, but not entirely correct. And um, I have two young children and my son, when he was in school, his, um, in the UK, he was three years old at a nursery and they had a project called um, All Around the World. And so I said, oh, that's great. And they took a, a different country each week. And what ultimately I found out when I, once I saw the project at the end was that consisted of about seven, uh, it, over the course of 11 weeks, seven European countries. Africa was one of the weeks. So, you know, while, while no one directly said that Africa was a country, if you're comparing Africa to Belgium or Africa to Europe, Sweden, mm -hmm. 
then why wouldn't a child think that that's a country, you know? So, so I think it's that kind of willful tokenism and um, unwillingness to go any further than the surface of the African diaspora and the and you know black and brown cultures. So um, so yeah, so this this project is really tackling that head on and yeah, thank you. How to engage people. Bless you. I'll tell you something. When my youngest son was in nursery, we they used to have this international day, international day. And on that international day, you bought foods. So mm -hmm. you dressed in your national costume, your national clothes, and you brought foods from your country. So there was a a young child and her parents were from Sierra Leone. So her mother dressed beautifully and she bought a dish of rice and chicken and vegetables, you know, traditional vegetables. So one of the mothers commented and she said, but it's meant to be from your country. Why have you brought rice? And I looked at her and I said, where do you think rice comes from? Tesco's? Mm -hmm. I said, do you think there are only paddy fields in? Where do you think the paddy fields are? She said, mm -hmm. what's a paddy field? I said, that's where rice is grown. Where do you think rice is grown? She said, I think rice is grown in England and in China. And I said to her, well, thank God we've got days like this that can help children and, mm -hmm. and their parents understand things. Thanks, um, Sarah, for sharing that. We are um, sorry to digress running... and bore you. No, sorry, you're not bored us at all. I wish we could go on for longer. We could have quite a, a wonderful discussion, but we are running out of time. Um, we're, we're we're nearing the end now. All of a sudden, the time has caught up on us because we've had this lovely discussion and wonderful contributions, which is always what happens. You think you're going to have more time at the end, but you don't. But I've taken the questions of people that indicated, so that's great. Um, a couple of things that I just wanted to um, uh, announce or, or mention, and um, that is that. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, Artists Union England is run by a small handful of volunteers. Um, we will have our AGM coming up and that will be advertised to members. We're always looking for people to be involved in the union and get active. So if that's of interest to you, do get in touch, but you don't need to wait for the AGM. We have put stuff out in our newsletter about anybody having any expressions of interest and in getting involved in our national executive, do get in touch. Um, we want to build um, a Black Workers Network of AUE members. And as mentioned at the beginning, we use Black in its broadest political sense in our trade union movement, that is Black and Brown people. Um, and so if you're interested in getting involved in that network and helping us build that and you know put together some activities, because it's much needed, there is a lot of wealth. We've got this wonderful race equality project led by Ashley and her team, we know that we have terrible um, institutional racism in the arts and culture sector that needs tackling and addressing that our members are impacted by. Um, so we do want people to be involved, not just in the, in the Black network, but the other equality networks, LGBT+, um, disabled workers, women, um, young workers, so we want to build all of those networks. So do get in touch with me, Zeta at Artist Union England or .uk, um, if you're interested in those. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that each year the TUC Race Relations Committee um, uh, hosts an art exhibition which I curate, which is called the Roots Culture Identity Art Exhibition. We celebrated our 10th year this year which was incidentally set up as one of the Stephen Lawrence task group mm -hmm. recommendations to use the Marble Hall at the TUC headquarters as a space to showcase the creative talents of young black people. Because as you will know, actually, Stephen had aspired to be an architect. Um, so that's been running for 10 years. We ran it as a sort of one off, but it was so successful that we ran it again the next year. And then I started to work on um, getting it to tour and getting it into different places during the course of the year, rather than it just being a standalone thing that ran and coincided with the TUC Black Workers Conference. So it's focused on young black workers, 
but we don't define what is young and we don't <laughs> limit it to any age now um, because um, even though it started off focused on young people, we recognize and we had people reaching out to us who were marginalized of all different ages because they came to the UK as a refugee because they didn't have those opportunities when they were younger and they faced barriers and not even been able to pursue the career they wanted in the arts because of that racism that they faced. So we don't limit it by age, but it's an opportunity to showcase your work um, at an exhibition that lasts two or three weeks and coincides with the Black Workers conference which means you can engage with everybody participating in, in in that and have a stall if you want to to sell your wares and merchandise and art um, and then we do look for opportunities during the year the last two years because of the pandemic we've been online um, and um, the exhibition is still accessible um, in its archives for the last two years online but we are hopeful aren't we will that by next year, we will be able to be in person again with the um, exhibition. Um, you just posted uh, the link in the chat, Zita. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's a link again in the chat there, so you can have a take a look at the exhibition. Incidentally, there is um, at least one of artists beside me who's in the world reimagined that was also in this year's exhibition too. Um, yeah, so that was nice to see <laughs> that, that that individual also had um, a globe who was in our exhibition. So again, we welcome you um, putting yourself forward around February. That's when I'll put the notice out and circulate it and we put it out through the AUE newsletter as well. Um, I want to thank um, our speakers, thank all of those who um, uh, were able to tear themselves away from the, the candy and the tricks <laughs> for a couple of hours and join us. And we will share the recordings if you want to share it with other people. Um, we'll put it on our YouTube channel and send a link out, you know, for, to, to the members through our newsletter. Thank you so much, Ashley and Will, for being here and for your presentations and talks. It's much appreciated. Um, and I want to thank Martin, who's um, one of our um, officers of AEB, who's been doing all the admin and stuff um, behind the scenes for this and during the meeting. Um, and thank you all for attending and hope to engage with you further um, going forward and um, continue to have connections and work together um, because we have a big battle on our hands in terms of the racism we face with the current regime we have in power, the policies that they have, immigration policies, the Rwanda deal, we've still got Windrush compensation that hasn't been issued, but in our own um, movement and in our own um, area of work, our own sectors, we know that there is a big battle to fight the racism. We shouldn't forget that during the pandemic, black women were the biggest group of people to lose their jobs and stop working in the arts and entertainment sectors. Um, and that has to be reversed and um, addressed because we not only deserve a seat at the table, but actually we bring, bring value um, to the whole of society by being at that table and our voices being heard and our work being seen and contributed. Um, thank you so much. Hope you have um, a good rest of the evening. I never heard my doorbell go once from <laughs> trick or treaters. So it's <laughs> unusual. Perhaps they've gone quiet in this, you know, since the pandemic. It's quite, it has quietened down. So that's, perhaps it hasn't picked up. Um, and take care, everybody. Have a good evening and hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.